Today is Monday, May 13th, 2013. This is the start of an interview with Mr. William Hull at the Clinton Macomb Public Library, 40,900 Romeo Plank Road, Clinton Township, Michigan, in partnership with RSVP of Macomb. Mr. Hull is 80, you'll be 89 the end of this month? Yeah, 89 this month. 29th. May 29, 1924. Mr. Hull currently resides at 21435 Wendell Street, Clinton Township, Michigan. My name is Dave Busso, and I'll be the interviewer, and Ann Bartlett will be the videographer. Mr. Hull, would you state for the records of Dr. Service you serve? I served in the uh, the Third Army in Europe from about June 44 to January in the church to the same time in the next year. The war ended in January. However, I, I was on occupation duty with for six months. Part of that uh, time, occupation duty was with the 83rd Division. Okay. You were not born locally. I was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And your family composed of? I have one brother. Older brother? Who was in yeah, the Navy? Six, year, six years old, Raymond. And he served in the Navy. What was his rank? rank? Oh, just a seaman. Seaman. You came into the war in March, 1942. I was inducted in 1944. March. Yeah, March 43. I was inducted in March, but in my area. Uh, they, I, I, with all the seniors in high school, when Dr. March, the draft board said stay in school and you graduate in June. They came right into the school with that day. Well, we met with them. And so we took our physical, and we were duct, legally inducted in March. We were a member of the armed services on, on with a deferred reporting time for June. How did you feel about that? Well, I felt like we all, were all, all, we were all very patriotic at that time. Uh, we all knew we were, we were anybody of military age who was uh, healthy was going to go. So uh, we just, everybody was doing the same thing, so to speak. So everybody pretty much at that age were aware of the... Oh, yeah. They, they had War a situation and they had a choice of the Navy, the Marine, the Army, Air Corps, oh, really? Coast Guard. What did your parents think about that? Uh, they didn't say too much, but I'm sure my father worked for the Boston Navy Yard, so he was in a kind of quasi military, and uh, uh, and everybody, all the neighbors had gone. So to speak, any of them older than me had gone, and I, uh, they didn't say much. Of course, they were disappointed uh, that the two sons had to go to war. But yeah, uh, was, was that before the government decided that? I guess it was that the, no family members, more than one, could be stationed in the same. Yeah, the, they had that policy, area. But, but it didn't always work. Yeah. See, the Sullivan brothers, the five of them, that's what started. Yeah. But only three of them were on one ship, and two of them were on another ship. By coincidence, both ships were sunk. Now, in my case, in my regiment, there were twins. And they worked in the regimental headquarters in the name Motorpool. So the, the rule worked sometimes, yeah. not having two brothers in the same unit. Well, it got a lot of publicity and 
politicians were oh, forced yeah, to right. take a step. I mean, five kids, that must have been devastating. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> you and Amy, Stephen? That's later. Okay. So you head off to where? For well, I went to Fort Devon's induction center, which doesn't exist anymore. That's in Massachusetts. That was in Massachusetts. From there, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, for my basic training. Then I went uh, shipped up to New York, Camp Kilmer. Oh, the, there's two camps right side by side. One is in, uh, where where the soldiers leave, and the other is where the soldiers come back. And Kilmer was one of them. And then when overseas, we were the first American troops to land directly on mainland Europe. Okay, let's go back. Your, your, your boot camp, what was that like? Good. I mean, it was, it was pretty rough. They, uh, but we had... Uh, infantry? Infantry, yes. We had hard-nosed uh, cavalry, but they were good and fair. You remember how long you were in boot? Yeah, about four months. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. Then I was. Then after that, the Army Specialized Training Program, which is this here, uh, had started, and I was assigned to the Army Specialized Program at the University of Maine, and uh, I was there one term, and then they closed the whole program down to, across the country. How come? I politics. Eleanor Rosa, they said it was Eleanor Rosa's baby. You know what I mean? The Army Special Chamber. I don't, I don't think it was. Uh, Eleanor Rosa was to blame for anything. Uh, they needed they needed infantry, and they needed them bad. So they closed down the... Well, that's one of the reasons they went into the schools. Usually you wait till you're out a year or so, or maybe just graduating, but... There were occasions when the need was so great. They yeah, just oh, yeah. went and took you out of high school. Yeah. Worry about letting you finish yeah, later. You're 18, you're on your, you're on your way. If you're 17, you could join up. Yeah, I mean, and not the Army, but the Navy or Air Force, Marines. Any other special training you got while you were in boot? No, boot camp was just uh, the routine training. Uh, there were lots of things uh, that we Discipline. Your discipline was number one. Yes, you, 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 you got, you got in instructions. You better follow. Them. And of course, you were up to that. Oh yeah, I had no trouble with boot camp. I like boot camp. But you wouldn't do anything wrong. Oh no, I you, you saved that till you got out. I well, yeah, I. <laughs> I, I, I filled a big bag of wrongdoings, which I expelled after I got service. So where do you go from boot? Well, to the University of Maine. Then from there to? Tennessee Manuvas. And I, uh, that was the 26th Division, that's the Yan Yankee Division, which is the Massachusetts National Guard. Mm -hmm. It's only coincidence I got. They were on maneuvers in Tennessee, and, we, and all of the soldiers from Maine, down at Abbey Chester Training Program, was sent to Tennessee to 26th Division. What did you do at Fort Jack Jackson in Columbia, South Carolina? Uh, that was really pleasant. I just trained in the daytime, and that's just, More know, infantry training? Yeah, infantry training. We had all kinds of training. Rifle training, machine gun training, uh, if a stage, and, uh, tactics. And, uh, Do you have any idea where you were going to end up going? No, I had no idea at that time. No, but I don't think I knew. I, uh, the government uh, wouldn't even have known while I was there that where I would be. No scuttlebutt floating around there. No, eh? a lot of rumors, yeah. We were supposed to be going to the Pacific, we were going to go here, we were going to go there, maybe we were going to go to Antarctica. <laughs> so at that point you didn't even know what theater no. you were going to be in? No, no. Tell me about your, your, your trip over to England. 
Well, we, we were the first convoy to go directly to mainland Europe. It was a huge convoy of 156 troop ships. Wow. Plus all the Navy ships that went to, uh, with us to Is protect us. Is there much room on the Atlantic Ocean? <laughs> it's a long <laughs> ride. So, a big... It's a long ride from here to England. Did you get seasick? From, uh, we left New York. New York, England. It took us 11 uh, 12 days. Did you get seasick? Oh, not going. It was calm as could be. Really? But when I came back, if we came back, we hit, were in a hurricane, and I got sick. Oh, did I get sick. That's the worst feeling in the world. Well, if I hadn't drank some, a, a guy was passing around a bottle of Hummel. It's a, like a, it's a, it's a liquor. And we all took our, oh, we took a share plus, and that, uh, I left that in, in the English Channel. <laughs> Now, when you went over in this convoy, what time frame are we talking about? Uh, June, July, in that frame. Right what? after the D-Day landing. Right? No, uh, we were uh, D-Day had was uh, D-Day had occurred. Right. And we had they had taken the uh, Cherbourg Peninsula where a good part of D-Day took place. And they had made that big the co uh, campaign called Cobra, which they drove the Germans many, many miles. We Operation joined- Operation Cobra. Pardon? Operation Cobra. Yeah. We joined at, just at the tail end of, the Cobra came to a standstill because of the resist, German resistance. And that's when we joined the lines. So you followed D-Day by what, four weeks, three weeks? Oh, yeah. And you went right to France rather than going to England? Yeah, I went right to France. And they, they, and they assigned us to the Third Army. And that was in central France. Right. Down in, in the area of Metz and uh, Verdun and uh, Strasbourg. So what, what was that? In France, what'd you call that, Cherub? Where you went in France, you landed in where? We landed in Cherbourg. 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 C H E R B E I. Something. <clears throat> and when you joined the Third Army, that's when you met God. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> no, I was wounded. And uh, I was on the front lines, and it was the November 9th or 10th uh, when we started that big drive. And uh, I was wounded, uh, not seriously, I, I was wounded in the foot. And when I went to, uh, what happened, and, um, another soldier, who I can't remember who, he and I had got a stretcher to carry uh, uh, Another a soldier from my unit to the aid station. He was wounded. And uh, he, his leg was torn up and on. And uh, he wasn't bleeding very bad. So we took him to the uh, first aid tent, which was behind the front lines, of course. And we took him in and we <coughs> set him on the ground, set the stretcher on the ground. And it was an empty chair. And I was so pooped from carrying him. And uh, I saw that empty chair. Man, I grabbed it and sat in it. And a medic walked by and he said, what's wrong with your foot? And my foot was bleeding. And my, the top of my shoe was torn open. And I, so he took my shoes off, both shoes, and he said, you know, I wounded, you got trench foot. So they, they evacuated me. But I was only in the hospital about three or four days. That comes from walking in water and the dampness and not changing socks and shoes and so on. So then God came in to see you? Well, he came in while I was there. Oh! And oh, no, there was that. a room as big as this whole library, <laughs> I guess. No, half the library. And 
I was in one corner, just coincidence, on carts. And the officers were in that fire corner, the wounded officers. And he came in a back door. And uh, we're, we're talking about General Patton. Patton. And Metz. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he walked up to this uh, lieutenant and he said, Lieutenant, how did you get wounded? He lieutenant says, I accidentally shot myself in the foot. And Patton said, sons of bitches like you, they keep this war going. <laughs> I could just hear it, you know. <laughs> Those probably were his exact words. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. I like that. No, just the same. I think he was. He would. He never could have done Eisenhower's job. No. But he was yes, a genius no. at what he did. On the other hand, I'm not sure Eisenhower could have done his job like he did. No, you two listen and be disaster. What you had was called uh, trench foot or trench foot. pink foot? Trench foot is what you get when you don't change your socks and shoes uh, often enough. And your feet, it's like if you eventually turn to gangrene. So what's your, pink foot? Pardon? Pink foot. Trench foot. Not pink foot. You said something to me. Maybe I just misunderstood you. You said pink foot, and I circled that, and I never heard that word. No, I was pink twice. foot. Fence. And I was wounded in the foot, uh, across the top of my left, right foot. Sure. And that wasn't that bad, it says. Is that what you got your Purple Heart for? I got another two Purple Hearts. I got one for that, and the other one I can't remember. Offhand, I can't remember what I, there must be a hole somewhere. That yeah, it, <laughs> it, goes, it goes from here, right to here. Okay. <coughs> you also told me Patton had a son who became a general. I yes, he was that. at West Point during World War II. And he graduated, and he worked, uh, he served, of course he went up through the ranks, and he became a general, two-star general. and. Uh, uh, when I went back to Massachusetts to visit, now my parents had long died, um, they, uh, a lady who I graduated with had a, a mini reunion for me, and there were about 12 classmates, and, uh, uh was it, what's your question? Oh, it was Patton's son. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was at West Point at that time. I'm trying to get the connection between my, uh, you know, I'm getting old. Did you, did, did you see him after when you came No, back? no, I went to, we went to his house, home. We had dinner, uh, Patton's daughter-in-law was a wonderful lady, and of course Pat, Mrs. Patton had long died, uh, and his daughter-in-law took us out to dinner at an upscale Greek restaurant in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And which was right nearby, and we had a long talk with her, and she was very well informed. But she said, "I can't introduce you to my husband because he said, he wouldn't he wouldn't even know you were in the room. He had Alzheimer's and dementia and, and Parkinson's." Um, <clears throat> but I went to his uh, I went to visit uh, the family and, and Judge Pat Donovan. She was, she was very, uh, very pleasant and very conversant. And then we went to, uh, to Patton Jr. We went to his uh, burial service in Washington, D.C. A friend drove us down there, and uh, we met her there again in the family. He's buried in Arlington? Um, yes, he's buried in Arlington. So whatever became of Pat and son, you know? Pat had several children. Uh, one become a, one was a general, and he got to, to a two-star general. And when then he retired, and he's the one I'm ta I've been talking about. He uh, and one was a. They, they did all different kinds of things. So they had, that one son is the only one that was in the army. There was a son that would join the navy. And there was a son that became a writer, a son became a carpenter. 
And uh, when did he have time to do all that? Well, these are his children. They, they didn't follow him at his at the West Point. Really? No, they didn't. Uh, Mrs. Pat and I, now again, when you say again, was a very congenial person. That's, I mean, his daughter-in-law. Now, Mrs. Patton was a, uh, was an heir to the heirs, A-Y-E-R-S, heirs of Patton Medicine Fortune. Oh. And in 1930, she inherited $30 million. Oh, my goodness. In 1930, you could have bought Macomb County for $30 million. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Patton's wife was a very fine person, and uh, then his, uh, this is his daughter that we uh, visited. And she was she was a very fine person too. The Patton family, a, a good family, uh, they their name wasn't Patton. Their name was Mercer. But they got in some kind of legal problems and they escaped out of Scotland. <laughs> Came to South Carolina, took a boat and landed in South Carolina. And they were known as Mercers then. And they changed their names to, 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 so they'd be incognito. Like a lot of immigrants that yeah. came over. That was nothing. Right. New. Right. Well, how far did you follow Patton's Third Army? Well, I, we joined them. Uh, at, at Cherbourg Peninsula when we landed. At some point, a few days afterwards, they announced to us we were in the 3rd Army. They also told us what corps. Now, corps were flexible. You could be in the 3rd Corps today and 8th Corps tomorrow. But the Army, it didn't change. Uh, uh, as we came, went down the Cherbourg Peninsula and followed the route of Cobra, only we swung a little more south. Uh, somewhere along the line, we were told we were in the third, we were going to be in the Third Army. And uh, we went to France, uh, southeast of Metz, uh, and uh, we fought uh, with the Third Army for the rest of the war. Pretty tough fighting? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The, actually, we were there from November to December 19th or 20th, you know, the Battle of Belgium on the 16th, was it 16th? How yeah. close were you to the Battle of the Bulge? We were 100 miles. 100 miles. But we, uh, Patton loaded us on trucks and raced us up to the Battle of the Bulge. See, he, he knew the Battle of the Bulge was coming. And this is a, a lie that the government and the army tell that so the, the Germans attacked, so we made a surprise attack. The Germans were for weeks building up material, army, uh, tanks, half tracks, trucks, and supplies, soldiers, east of Luxembourg. Well, why would they be doing that? That's, uh, the only reason uh, would be to get ready for an attack. And, and the British uh, aerial photography was photographing that area at night and uh, night after night, and the Americans would photograph the activity during the day, and Patton's intelligence section uh, was getting that, because uh, John Fotheringham, who lives in Toledo, he's not, not living anymore, um, he was a desk sergeant and, uh, for the intelligence section of the Third Army. Everything that came in, he had to uh, uh, log it. And he had to log it, he had to see it. And he said, you know, for about three weeks before the Battle of Bulge hit, he was getting rather caustic information about this build-up. He said they, they knew that they, they were building up. And the fact is, they weakened the front lines in the Belgium and Luxembourg to hoping, the well, I'm just not hoping, but anticipating that the Germans would hit and they were going to let them go to the Meuse River. And they, they, they put armed forces on the west side of the, route, the Meuse River that they never could have got across the river. It was, it was, it was a sucker trick. 
the third army was going to hit them from the north, and the third army was going to hit them from the south, which is pretty much the way it worked. There were some um, there were some mistakes made. Uh, time, uh, they didn't time it. The Americans didn't time it just right, and they weren't quite ready. And what they did, they put the first army put the 106th and the 99th division on the north side. Well, the 106th division only had been in the, the Europe five days, mm -hmm. and it was it was a sacrifice. In your view, Patton was quite the military strategist. Oh no, no, no doubt. He's just, he's, well, I mean, he could see things coming a long time before they got there. He had a mental telepathy, or whatever you want to call it, that uh, people don't understand. He could see in his mind what problems was going to happen <coughs> the next day. Or two. It would seem he was born to go to war. Yeah, yeah. I he was lost that. if the war was over. Completely lost, or and lost if he had to be Eisenhower, for example. Yeah, he wouldn't have done that. He would. He, he would have failed. Not good at handling people, short of getting people to the front and yeah. fighting. He was a, a status a tactician. So after the Battle of the Bulge, you were still, where did you end up when the war ended? Well, Czech? I, by Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Well, after the Bulge, it lasted until uh, late January, like January 25th, we moved, but then we moved back in somewhere near our sector that we had left to go into the, the, the Bulge. And then we fought for the Rhine, and we took Kaiserslautern, uh, which is a well-known, and there's a lot of American military people that have been in Kaiserslautern because there's a big American training camp there. And then we went from Kaiserslautern, we went to the Rhine, across the Rhine on an engineer bridge. And uh, then we took Darmstadt, which was uh, rubble. It was a big city, but it was, it was bomb terrible. And then we, from Darmstadt, we went to Fulda, which is just south of Frankfurt, then Wesberg, and then we turned south and we went through Regensburg, which is uh, very close to the Czech border. And then we crossed the uh, Danube River at Passau, P A S S E A U, and uh, then we were in Austria and we went to Linz, uh, in the area of Linz. We didn't go into the city, but we went and then it made a U-turn. And part of our, uh, my group, I wasn't with them, they uh, released the Malhausen concentration camp. Malhausen, I, I think I'm pronouncing it right. It was near Linz, but I was in, my battalion wasn't in that path, so to speak. We swung, uh, the U-turn swung north, and we ended up in Czechoslovakia. So you didn't see the... Uh, I did not. I saw a forced labor camp. Slave labor camp. We, we released two or three of those. What was that like? Well, that was one notch above the concentration camp. Uh, uh, the, these people were from everywhere. Estonia, Latvia, France, uh, goodness knows where they're from. And we talked to them. And uh, you see, I, I could... Uh, there was a fellow in my squad, blue shot fellow, Jewish, who was 100% uh, Jewish. He spoke Yiddish fluently, because they spoke it in their home. And uh, he did a great deal of talking for us. He would, and then he, and when he was talking, I was picking up the German language. So I got to, before I left Germany, well, of course, I was on occupation duty, uh, six months after the war ended. I was but in you, Austria. You stayed right in Austria. No, so. yeah, we went. No, went went to Austria to Czechoslovakia. The war ended. They moved us to Fulda, to a, a huge German military training camp. I was there a few days, and because I wasn't married, see, they were picking, separating the married right. soldiers from the unmarried, because the unmarried soldiers 
were going to be held over for occupation. Right. They're going to ship the married soldiers, Go especially ahead. those with children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get home and get, get, get your civilian clothes on. They didn't want. They had, you know, they paid them more. So they, I went back into Austria, <laughs> and I when I went back in Austria, I joined this 83rd Division, and I was with them on occupation duty. When was the second time you were wounded? Where were you when that? I don't know. You don't know where? I can't remember. You, you don't know where you were? I know where I was or where I was wounded. I, Maybe you really weren't wounded. Well, I, I was hit. <laughs> but you see, some of us were hit and never went to the medics. Yeah. Or, 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 the, or the medic that was attached to our company patched us up. And. Uh, uh, and that happened a lot. I'm sure it did. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of those cases, they didn't even know how they got shot. It, it stray bullets flying all over the place. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I've seen this happen. I don't know how many times, but more than once. A guy would get shot through the shoulder and he, and he wouldn't even feel it. It would desensitize, uh, stun the nerves, and we had that happen. Hey, one soldier said to the other, "Hey, you just got shot through the shoulder." Oh, I did. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, sure enough. It would, his shoulder. Yeah, sooner or later, it would, it would have begun to hurt, but it was numb from the shot. Well, it probably didn't hit any vital. No. <clears throat> or bone, where there would be more nerve endings. And that's why I, I, I can't remember the second time I was hit, but I was hit. I, in fact, I was hit three or four times with shrapnel, but didn't hurt. It might have torn my clothes a little bit, uh, uh, but that was about it. Did the second time you were hit require hospitalization? No, no, no? only the first time. How likely is it that some of those men that got shot never got the Purple Heart? Uh, the Purple Heart is a, is a, is a, what do you call it? Is a... Wounded in action, right? Yeah. It was a, a very much abused. Uh, to give you an example, I think I told you the other day, I follow, uh, there were some brothers we were in the service. They weren't in the same uh, unit. Their name was Kozinski. Um, after the war, they didn't have anything to do. They were off playing football. <coughs> and this fellow's brother hurt his knee playing football. Well, I got hurt playing football. I got hurt worse playing football after the war than I did uh, getting wounded. Anyway, he got a, he hurt his knee, went to the medics and got a purple, they, after the war was all over, they gave him a purple heart. And some got all shot up and never got a purple well, heart. That's true. Some wouldn't take a purple heart. Right. It was a, it was a, it was a, a mix. How's it go? The heroes were the ones that never came home. I, uh, now, I held a fellow, John LaFort, from Sacramento, California. I held him while he died, and he, uh, from shell blast. And the blood was coming out of his ears. And I held him as long as he could, and he finally turned green and purple green and color. And you can tell when somebody's dying, the skin changes. And, uh, then I was in the, the few, the three days out of the hospital, there was a nurse, she was huge. She wasn't obese, just plain large person. She must have been six foot, six foot two. Mm. Wonderful woman. And uh, I, uh, when I got to the hospital, like three or four o'clock in the morning, I got out at about 10 o'clock, the sergeant came to me and he said, anybody can walk, he's gotta go up to the next floor and help take care of the wounded. Well, I could walk and my foot was, they had a bandage on it. And I went up there and I was uh, pretty doping because they doped you up and they, when they were carrying the ambulance, they do, 
you know, they see, give you some, mm -hmm. they see nature, so because they don't want you to go wild and ambo. Anyway, this big nest, I walked up the steps and I was just walking slowly, and she grabbed me by the collar. Now I think she lifted me right off the floor. <laughs> she says, "Soldier, come here," and she took me over to a soldier that was on a gurney. Yeah, it was a gurney about this high. And she took the bottle of glucose, you know what they use. She slapped it in my hand. She said, hold as high as you can. And then a few minutes later, she was in another part of the ward. And she yelled over, how's he doing? I said, he's dying. Hold it a little higher. Well, he died. Mm -hmm. I, you know what? I did not look at his doctor. I should have, but I didn't. Why would you want to know that? Well, I, uh, I, I come now. I'm, I'm curious. I don't want to, because uh, several reasons. One of them is uh, what I did. I contacted several families of uh, soldiers that were killed that I was with at the time. I probably would have contacted the family. That's awful nice. I'm sure that. But it, touch. it is not always a good experience, though. No, I'm sure. Uh, uh, and I quit after about four or five. Uh, you can, you can, you just, some families are very appreciative, some aren't. Really? Oh. One guy, he was going to, he yelled and screamed and hollered. And he, oh. was gonna, he was going to sue the president. He was going to oh. do this, he was going to do that. I got up and walked out. I tell you, I went to one house in a very low economic area of this town in New Hampshire. And it was rolling down. In New Hampshire's all hills. They were rolling down and turned right, and there were houses right at the bottom. I, I walked up on the porch, and they had a wooden screen door. And I knocked on the door, and a man sitting, sitting over on that side of the room, and she was sitting on, and his mother was sitting on this side. And I, they, I could tell by looking at and they undoubtedly were the mother and father of this dead, dead soldier. So I knocked on the screen door and no answer. So I opened the door and stepped in and said, I'm the old I was the first time when was killed and I thought, anything I can do to kind of help you or explain it. She sat there just like this. Hmm. And he sat there like this. No, just the opposite. He had his arm forward. Just like this. And he shot heavy set. No, real heavy set. And the mother sat there with her hands. I think she was crocheting and she was holding the ball and the yarn. I went in, I told him all that I knew. You know, she had about this time. And then I, they didn't say a word. It was spooky. So I said, well, I told you all I know. I will leave now, and I walked out. Were you in uniform? I, d I don't know. I don't remember. I <laughs> should remember. I probably was. Probably. But I got into the... My own family were my worst problems. Really? Yeah, my mother you know, kept yelling at me. And, well, Dismiss it from your mind. I'd be talking to somebody, neighbor, or somebody about the war, and that was her solution. Dismiss it from your mind. Will you? I, I, I well, sixty-seven. Some did. Some, <coughs> some did. But sixty-some years, I can tell you right now, right to the uh, minute detail of things that happened. Then my father, uh, I didn't have any clothes that fit because I gained some weight on uh, occupation duty. And so I was wearing my uniform, and I was going to buy clothes. And about the third day, he said to me, he says, it's time to take that uniform off. <clears throat> and we had words. Well, you, you get used to it. It's almost like uh, part of you. Yeah. And if you take it off, you feel lost. <laughs> well, I... Particularly when you you're in circumstances that you were in. Well, I just didn't have any clothes uh, that I could wear. That I, when I graduated high school, uh, my weight was down. 
And uh, and then when I got home from this, after being on occupation duty six months, I would well, probably gain 30 pounds. Did you write home often? <clears throat> yeah. Well, not often, but all, uh, now and then. And, uh, your mom, I, I think you'd call it often. Your mom write too? Oh, yes. Yeah. They, Were you able to call? No. No. Not that I know of. No, I just didn't. There was a possibility of calling, but uh, we never got to call. We worked with Viva. Which, the Female. Female. You, you never got on your computer and said, <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? <coughs> yeah, <I'm a> <laughs> What were your duties, responsibilities during the occupation? Uh, standing guard, which was a joke, because there's no no place, no, we wouldn't have any disturbance or anything. No hostilities. But there's a rule: any encampment of GI, somebody has, it's 24 hours they have a guard. Uh, you didn't have any prisoners there. No, no, they. <laughs> Our pr uh, prisoners were ca uh, captured and sent back, and there was a regimental compound. And my former squad sergeant had been promoted, and he was in charge of all the prisoners that you know, my regiment took. <coughs> Once you took a prisoner back, he, you were no longer had any contact. Once he took over, you're, you're, uh, you're free to go back to your line. And you, you, you don't try. You, I could talk to him, but I couldn't talk to him. Even though I maybe could. How long did it take <clears throat> for the U.S. to get all the prison camps opened up? Oh, very soon. Uh, I would say, oh, I would say, because there weren't a lot of small ones, they were usually kind yeah. of big ones. I think they were mostly, the, when we met the Russians, any prison camp, concentration camp, was closed. I mean, was open. And they were, uh, our medics were very busy uh, examining people, delousing them. And I did not get involved in that end of it. You never saw any prisoners? Oh, yeah. Oh, did you? I took prisoners. No, I mean, I don't mean prisoners. I mean, um, camp. the camp. Americans that were prisoners of war when they opened up the camp. Well, yeah. Uh, we did. We found some. Gosh, that must have been terrible. In Linz, we, uh, there was a great big old house where American uh, prisoners were kept. We released, we released that to the Germans out of town. And then there were some Canadians in that group. Hmm. Uh, Tell me about the Black Tank Battalion. Well, you ought to read this book. <laughs> They, Seven sixty first. The, Eleanor talk. Roosevelt felt that the blacks were actually were black people. Well, yeah, they yeah. I was uh, surprised I never heard about it. Uh, she thought that they were being segregated and too much. And they should be uh, included. Because after all they're Americans, taxpayers, like everybody else. And she pushed and pushed and had, she had a lot of support too, that they would make black units. And the two tank battalions were just two of the number of battalions. In fact, it was a black regiment in Italy. And uh, uh, although segregation and discrimination was alive and well at the time, but we got along very well with the uh, black tankers. One of the units were attached to your group, weren't they? Yeah, 761st. Till the time you were saved by them 
Oh, seven sixty first. We were in Moorville, France. We were just got on the lines, and we were, went into an attack. We fought like crazy. We had some guys killed. I can almost I can name the guys that were killed in my company. Uh, we fought. Ayot, Pochebeck, Vice, uh, and uh, a couple more then come to mind. These were guys I, I saw a kill. Anyway, we got that hill at great cost. Went, went down the front side of that hill, and all over to our right was this town of Moorville. And the Germans were there, they had retreated to that town. And we were, we were down, pretty well down this front side of the hill. And we heard these mo engines going. What in the world? And here come the 761st, a part of the 761st tank battalion. They came up behind us and come over the hill, and then they shot at the town Rosa of Morville Mar so furiously that the Germans would she skipped out of the town. Retreated. Retreated. Mm -hmm. And we were with them, with the Black Tank Battalion from then on, in the alsace learning campaign until we went to the bulge. And we, we liked, the one thing we liked about the Black Tank was they, uh, during the night, they would start their tanks a couple of times. This is our army procedure. And when they start their tanks, they have a big, thing on back with uh, a hood, like it's quite thick. Then we'd lift it up and we'd take our canteen cups and fill them with water, put them on the exhaust manifold, boil the water, and make coffee. Well, don't get it. Three o'clock in the morning. But, but what was the purpose of starting them up? Just to keep them heated up? Yeah, that's that's a, a routine they go through. Must have been cold? It was yeah, getting cold in France. You rescued some tankers, though, and took them to the... Some of the black tankers you rescued. Well, we that's when I got wounded. I was mm -hmm. carrying a... See, we, they went in... They, they fought with us. And a, ba a battle, the next battle, I believe... I'll give my time sequence here. Uh, attempt, yeah, it was that, that was that occasion. We, uh, they fought the Germans, and the tank nearest where I was, I was laying on the ground, and uh, uh, I, I looked up and I saw one tank, I saw where a German artillery came. I didn't see it go in the front, but I saw it come out the back. It went right straight through the tank. Anyway, we, we helped to get, to, after things quieted down, I helped uh, the first item says, help, help those guys. And uh, uh, we helped get them out, uh, out of the tank. And the tank, we helped. We got the guy out and he was, his leg was torn open. Uh, and we the knee up to the butt. And uh, uh, we put him on a stretcher. All the tanks have stretches to uh, strap to the back across the motor. And we took the stretcher off and, put, and got him out of the tank and put him on the stretcher and we carried him to the aid station. So and let me tell you, you when you carry somebody with a stretcher for a mile, uh, you get pretty tired. So it was mutual rescue. He, they rescued them from that hill. And then they in turn rescued They rescued us and we rescued them. Yeah. From the tank. So it was a mutual. So then they left you after? Well, they fought with us all during Alsace-Lorraine campaign. That's also known as the Rhineland campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, then we, went, we were withdrawn back. See, we were uh, supposedly drawn back to have rest and relaxation and so forth for, for a number of days because we'd been fighting. But that was a lie. They drew us back to get us ready to go to the bulge. Because they knew down well the bulge was going to hit. And then until I go back, remember I told you about 
Yeah. <coughs> uh, John Fotheringham, he uh, checked in all the uh, information that came to intelligence, and we knew it was coming. Well, uh, they, it was supposed to be a sucker trip uh, to let them through. And, and Baston was surrounded, and we, we came up from the south, and we were with the Fourth Army. Now, they were a bunch of crazy cowboys, but they were good soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were nuts. But anyway, they made a little fight, and he, uh, they, uh, they went and shot up from where we were, uh, about 100 miles, and they, they took, they blasted their way into um, Baston. Of course, the Americans were in the Baston, but they blasted their way through the Germans to get to the Baston. Back to Patton for a minute. What, what do you think about, what did you think about the black people? To Patton, anybody who picked up a gun and fight was his buddy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's, uh, there's issues made of that. Did he like the black? Did, didn't he like the black? You know, didn't right. make any difference. Well, he was in war and you could Patton, fight. He, I don't care if you're green, yellow, or blue pink. <laughs> You, if you pick up a gun and fight, you're his, you're his. We interviewed a little guy, he must have been five, 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 six. He brought his jacket with him, his coat. He must have had 15 stripes on that sucker. Oh, he's a, he'd been in for a long time. He was driving and Gasoline truck following behind patents. Oh yeah, the whole war. Yep, yeah, yeah. We had and that walk. guy could barely reach the pedal, and that's all he did was go load up gasoline. We had and Patton fought the world of that guy. Oh, he was a buddy of Patton's. He was driving a fuel truck, mm -hmm. a gasoline truck. But they tried. They uh, see. They tried to screw Patton many times, yeah. and it was uh, an enormous amount of jealousy. Uh, uh, or, none of them. Uh, and they, uh, one way, uh, they, they, uh, Eisenhower was to blame. They cut off his gas supply, and, and this was in Alsace Lorraine, so his, his tanks couldn't move. They had little gas. <coughs> so what uh, Patton, being no dummy, uh, he had his trucks, the du deuces, you know what I mean? Uh, he had uh, the, the bumpers repainted with First Army identification on the bumper, because that's the way he identified the truck, instead of Third Army. So they went to the First Army <laughs> gas dump, and they got filled up, brought the gas back to the Third <laughs> Army. Well, Eisenhower had a certain order he wanted to follow. Yeah. And our Canadian friends were trying to get into Germany first. And well, yeah, English and Germany, he yeah. He knew that Patton would probably outrun him, and he took the gas away from him, because so, he knew he wouldn't pay attention to the order. <clears throat> I well, can't remember that the general that that picture there, Canadian He general. said, send a copy to Monty. <laughs> he didn't want to hate each other's guys. Because yeah. he preceded him. Can you see that? Let me get... Oh, uh, uh, yep. Let me zoom in a little bit. <laughs> it okay. says, Patton urinates in the Rhine River. <laughs> Got it. Yes. I would have loved to have met him. <laughs> and we 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 would have had a very high respect for Pat. You know, we hated him, we loved him at the same right. time. Right. <laughs> How would you compare him to MacArthur? Well, there, you can't. Not in fact. You can compare Eisenhower and MacArthur. I mean, they were both great genius. I think MacArthur probably was a little more knowledgeable than Ike, but Ike was pretty smart. He was in the right guy at the right place at the right time. So was MacArthur. Uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I'd say they're both uh, 
How would you envision both of them working together? <laughs> there was there's, there's room, room for their egos. <laughs> and wanted to go to the Pacific and fight with MacArthur. Right. Yeah. But uh, well, there were a lot of <laughs> with MacArthur wouldn't there were have a lot it. of uh, Eastern Theater people that were shipped to. Yeah. Are going to be shipped going to, to the yeah. Western. All the single guys were yeah. shifted around. I mean, there was a lot of talk of it. But the camps. I don't think we had a shipload. We may have had a shipload or two reach the, the Pacific, uh, but uh, it was over so quick. The time they organized and reorganized and moved the ship and across the Atlantic, across the Pacific. Any more stories of Patton you can recall? I don't know. I really enjoy hearing stories about him. I just think he was... <laughs> Sorry. There's no end to the stories about Pat. The only thing is I visited his home uh, in Massachusetts, which he, incidentally, he and his wife bought, but never had a chance to live there. He died. Uh, yeah, I, I tell you what. Tell me it, about the story of his death. He was assassinated. No, I thought you would no, say that. No, question. No, I agree with on that one. I think at that time, he knew the war was coming to an end. And broke his heart. And, yeah, really. Can you imagine somebody having a broken heart because the war is ending? But he could see there was nothing for him to do. Yeah. And, and he was in his glory during the war. Actually, he was trying to stimulate the war with Russia. He was trying to get he us. Would have, he would have done that's what he part. wanted. He said, we're going we're gonna to fight them sooner or later. Amazing. At that time, they were allies. And did you know Pat had his niece was on his staff, and they were having a little affair? No, I didn't. Yeah. His niece got, he got, she was in the military. He uh, full string got her assigned to his staff and uh, they were carrying it on. I, I don't think I helped to draw a picture. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I think he became quite depressed with the thought that the war was ending. And Oh, Monty, that's right. That's yeah. the guy he was trying to beat into Canada. I mean, uh, yeah. into Germany. Yeah, yeah. Montgomery. Yeah, Montgomery. And yeah. he hated Montgomery. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just got <laughs> they fought together. Uh, and the game plan was we have to have our Canadian friends be the first in, into Germany, and Pat wanted nothing to do with that, and that's when he went to that gas line. And he was in trouble with Ike all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was that other? general in between them. Bradley. Bradley? Bradley was a diplomat. Yeah. He, he, he would go to peace. Patton and try to slow him down and quiet him down and anyhow. Bradley uh, was served under uh, Patton in Africa. Yeah. But he got promoted and he served over Patton in Europe. Yeah. But Bradley and Patton got along quite well. Yeah. Yeah. So how long did you stay in in the Czech Republic or Austria? Oh, about three weeks or a month. That's all, eh? Yeah. Then they shipped you home? No. Uh, he, he Wars no, over. no, they shipped me back to Germany to that uh, big training camp called Del Herda. Uh, a lot of Americans were at Del Herda. It was kind of a... It was a great big military camp, which we took over. Then I, I was shipped because I was single. I was, I was shipped to Austria for occupation duty, and I was there yeah. till January. The war ended in May, and I got, you know, a couple months later I was in Austria. Austria is beautiful. Yeah. There was no fighting or anything. Well, well, uh, I went to. I went to the same area in Austria 
or an occupation duty as we did during the war. So then you got shipped home? Uh, in January. I can't remember the dates. Where did they ship you to New York? Yeah. We left Lucky Strike, uh, I think they were Lucky Strike, uh, they were in embarkation camps and named for cigarettes. But I think I left Lucky Strike. So you had to get home from there? No, no, no. <coughs> they provided some transportation right to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Really? We went by train and then uh, went into Boston and I, they gave me traveling papers or tickets or whatever. I took the train to Newburyport, which is about 35 miles north of Boston. Did your folks know you were coming home? Yeah, I was able to call my mother from New York. Right, so she was happy, huh? Yeah. And a lot of them hit home about the same time. Too. Yeah. You're home now. What, what, what's, what are you doing to try to get yourself back into the swing of... So it's all about the bar fights? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? There was a civilian. So those are the guys just too old to be drafted. They were big group of them. They were nice people, all right. But then there was a soldier that was overseas but not in combat. There were the soldiers that were never left the States. And of course, there was the combat. And these four groups didn't get along very well. And uh, there was a favorite bar in town. It was all the time in the woods. And big. And lo and behold, we go to that bar, and the combat soldiers were few in number. Because one, only one out of ten sees combat. For every combat soldier, there's at least ten to fifteen others. And uh, then we, we had a few combat soldiers would get together and they'd start to talk and, and, and then the talk would get louder and louder. And one of these other groups, especially the uh, civilian group, would make some smart remark. <laughs> That's all you had. Then, then the argument. Then the shepherd. Then that led to punching. <laughs> got to the point where we enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> now, we go out there deliberately to get into a fight. And uh, of course, combat soldiers will fight. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, it's obviously right. <laughs> and the, uh, well, that's how, the, unfortunately, I worked, I built a home for my folks. As soon as the frost got out of the ground. Where did you get the ability to build? I worked all when I was growing up uh, as a local carpenter, and I'd work for him uh, half a day or three hours or eight hours. So you learned enough to be able to build your Yeah, I, I knew how to build hours. Uh, and I had a fellow helpmate mm -hmm. who also knew. I had a thousand dollars saved up. My mother, my mother had a thousand. My father had a thousand saved up. Now that's a lot of money in '46. Plus the government. And uh, no, we went to the bank. We got a three thousand dollar loan. You didn't and go to the GI Bill. No. Oh. No. And so we. Why not? Uh, I don't know. I, I know. That's just what well, I guess it was my father's idea. And we went to the bank. Got three thousand dollars, and for six thousand dollars we built a house. Bungalow. You could pay for a house for six thousand bucks practically. Today to build that house would be seventy-five thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice house, and uh, I, we was well built. And then I went off to college. I How did you happen to do that? Well, two or three reasons. One, we're we're getting in too many fights at night. <laughs> so I said I got to do something. About it. I can't go on the rest of my life having bar fights. <laughs> and uh, so then. Uh, my my folks wanted me, my folks were all college people. My mother, my father, my grandmother, my brother, my uncle, and another uncle, and an aunt, and so forth. They were all post high school. Well, a couple of nurses, and we were kind of a college-oriented family. 
So yeah. did you use the GI Bill for that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. But I, I started applying for college, and I had attended for a short term at the University of Maine. Well, they told us at Maine, any soldier that comes back and, and applies will accept <coughs> for Elias. I came back, and I lived in Massachusetts. I wrote to them to the university, says, and explained it. Reminded them that they said that we could come back. They wrote to me back, very with one paragraph. You're a, you're a resident of Massachusetts. You can't take it. My next door neighbor, who was in the Navy, applied to the University of Maine and got accepted. Hmm. So, so where did you end up going? Oh, I went up to Ohio. I went to a small college in Ohio, halfway between Toledo and Fort Wayne called Defiance. Okay. Then I dropped out for a year and a half and worked at Willie's Oval where they made Jeeps. Of course they weren't making government Jeeps then, they were making civilian Jeeps. Then I went back and finished up college and uh, my wife then, uh, she wanted me to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a teacher. She, but she insisted, insisted. Well, the economic situation at Willie's Oval was uh, the working situation was getting them quite tenant because they merged with Kaiser Frazier, which was out of Little Run. And uh, uh, their argument was that, well, if you get a teaching job, you, you, got, you, you got a job for life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went back to college and took up education, which I really didn't want to do. And I took a job in 1950, and she and I taught on Kelly Island out in Lake Erie. Wow. There were 65 students in the whole school, and uh, we were there a year. Now this is your first wife. She went to Defiance also. Mm -hmm. Where did you meet her? Defiance. Okay. She was, a, during the war, they had cadet teachers. These are <coughs> people who had two years of college, could apply for a temp permit. They could teach that year. But they couldn't teach the next year unless they took a certain amount of college work. And they called that a cadet certificate. And she was working on uh, uh, her uh, van, uh, finishing up her <coughs> bachelor's degree. You were married, what, 57 years? I taught 50. No, you were married. We were married 57 years. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lady in between, which we get in a big argument about whether I was married to or not, but anyway. <laughs> Well, three and a half years. She died when? And she died. No, the first one. 2002. Oh, my goodness. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought she was a lot younger. No, no, no. She was 82 when she died. Wow. Well, then you went on a rampage. You did it two more times. Yeah. Goodness. What was the second one? Uh, Japanese. Yeah. But How long were you Three and made? a half years. Three, three and a half years. Uh, she died? Yeah. She died in aneurysm. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Which is the one that died in the car? It was she. Yeah, was she, she did. She did. Okay. And she had the aneurysm in the car. Gosh. That's a big adjustment. Mm -hmm. Then and you then, met the love of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And you met her in church. Yeah, we met her. Oh, my goodness. Thanks. So I'm under the wall involved. Yeah, they come yeah. right from God. That's yeah. amazing. She's got two wonderful nieces. One niece is kind of aggressive. She's a beautiful girl, but uh, she, she uh, looks about 25, but she's more than the whole. She's 60? She's close to 60. She's 60. But she, she uh, I was going out of church up the middle aisle. Mm -hmm. She grabbed me, she kissed me, she said, are you engaging? <coughs> I said, this little chick's hitting on me. <laughs> Man, what do I do next? <laughs> and how old were you then? Oh, oh uh, 80 something. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so, uh, then she said, after she, after she had said this, I'm shopping out of my shoes. She said, how old? Why don't you take my aunt out for dinner? Well, I says, who's your aunt? And she pointed to Dellen. Dellen was sitting in a pew, right where we were standing. So I 
we were very acquainted. And then, uh, that Sunday they uh, have a thing at the church, potluck. And we went down the, the lower level in the church it, and uh, we uh, talked. And I gave her her phone number. She gave me my phone number. <laughs> and she's one of, one of these ladies that believes a weight of a man's son, uh, heart is through his stomach. Doesn't all women know that? <laughs> <laughs> and I took, I, I took advantage of that. <laughs> I ate over her house. Then she, she, we couldn't, she couldn't get married because at that time, because she, she was taking care of an invalid sister, and she had uh, some, uh, she had a job, which I insisted she quit, which she did. And uh, then when her sister passed, we did get married. Now, which is the one you weren't sure you were married? The Japanese? The yeah, Japanese lady. I say we're married. She says we weren't. Do we need to go into this, or should we just let it go? Okay. <laughs> she was a wonderful person. Yeah. I, I was a great friend of her husband, who had passed away in 2001. We were great friends for 25 years. It was eminent. They both would have married. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I had an invalid daughter that required 24-hour care, mm -hmm. and after. Uh, she she retired from her job, and she helped take care of the, my daughter. Of course, I had known her for 25 years, and we 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 went on 24 trips together, went to Germany, oh. Washington D.C. Did you go back and see some of the places where you worked? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where Lieutenant Nelson was given. Only uh, very limited. Mm -hmm. Could you recognize it after that many years? Well, he was killed in the woods, and I went, uh, no, because we, in that part of Germany, we f did most of our uh, traveling and fighting in the woods. There was very little fighting going on. And I'll tell you about one incident where Lieutenant Nelson was killed. There was an opening in the woods, and the Germans, they would travel by night and sleep during the day, and they'd pitch their tents that morning. And some of them were in the tents. Well, Lieutenant Nelson was leading us through that uh, pedal path going into that opening where they were pitched, tents were being pitched. And some German grabbed a rifle and fired and hit Nelson right on his forehead mm -hmm. and killed him. And he was dead before he hit the ground. But we went after him. We massacred 15 of them. And there was about, I imagine, about 30. Because I was back over there, and I talked to one of the fathers who escaped, that German who escaped, and we figured it was 35, 40 in the whole group. And they, they escaped out through the woods. They didn't realize they were so young until after. Yeah. Well, anybody who shoot at us got shot back. Yeah, yeah they had a lot of young men mm -hmm. shine. They took young boys yes. to yeah. start training very early. That's all was left, yeah. They yeah. 16. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think 16 was it. Uh, I don't think they took 15 year olds, but they did take 16. Well, they had camps where they brought in the yeah. youngsters and indoctrinate them. And right. Mm -hmm. When I went over to Germany, it was what, what year? Mm -hmm. <coughs> No, 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 I went to Germany and I went to Germany to visit. Oh, we went 2005 and six. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. and the, we, we found the Germans very likable people. Mm -hmm. Actually, after the war was over, and things settled down, the Germans too. You know, like most people you war with, the, the, the common people mm -hmm. have very little... Yeah. They don't have animosity toward... Right, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, we like the gym. Upper right. hierarchy that created all that, mm -hmm. and those are the ugly things you hear. We liked them a lot better than the French. Really? And I'm French. Really? Yeah. French, Do you like French. the French? No. My first experience with the French, I'm not going to tell them. I understand. You walk me, but I will. We got off the boat at Cherbourg and got into trucks to be transported down the Cherbourg Peninsula to St. Mary of Greece. 
You know that that every time they show about the paratroopers on TV, no. they saw always this in St. Mary of Gleese. Well, we bivouacked right by that town. Oh. Anyway, the first stop, first corner, the truck stopped. Here's a little 10-year-old French kid. He said, Mademoiselle Zig Zig for chocolate. <laughs> Do I have to explain it? No. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Whatever she wanted, it was for chocolate. <laughs> they said, they get, send the kids out tending for the mother, the yeah, aunt, the grandmother. Yeah, yeah, well, war time's yeah. different to everything. Yeah, yeah you, you can't, you can't, can't I don't think it changes in France. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't go by that. So, you see, we, I did have some interesting experiences. <laughs> I, I called Patton a little rascal. I'm beginning to think you are, too. <laughs> I hope he's reformed. <laughs> you have some pictures or things you want us to see? Yeah. I got a lot more than this at home. But that will look thumb through that. And this is the book I wrote. It has the pictures. Will you give them? Uh, I'll leave these here. With you. No. What's this? You gave him one copy. No, not yet. Yeah, anything that you give us a copy of, we can. Oh, I'm going to use the camera. I'm sorry, I'm a little. Oh, anything that you give us a copy of, we can send down with your package to the Library of Congress. Yeah. Okay. Do you have? Do you keep any of that here? Uh, some of it will be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a copy of my book. Uh, I brought two. Didn't I bring two? And this one, I I made up a pamphlet, so to speak, several pages about the black in the in the, in the military. You compiled that. And uh, and as I go back to the Revolutionary okay. War, okay, the blacks had fought for the American in the Revolution too, you know, in the Civil War and the War of 1812. You got a picture here of some mountains. Is this that in a, Some guy, a friend, I can't remember his name, he took a lot of pictures of all of Europe and I, he gave them. Do you know where they were? Austria. Austria. Did you get that? This Austria is pronounced Easterreich in German. Did you get it, Dan? Well, my language getting so bad. She had to leave. No, she she's got to go back to work. Oh. Let's let me zoom in. Just tilt it like forward. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I, I put a. Now, uh, that tall flat fall right here is from Lum, Michigan, uh, among the pier. Lum is a little bird outside of the pier. He died recently, mm -hmm. but he and I kept con He's the only one I kept contact with. And I could verify, but he didn't write anything. Never wrote. Really? No, he never, I don't think he wrote a letter to his mother all the time. Oh, my morning. goodness. I never remember him to see him writing. Now this is the where the lieutenant was killed, and the Germans made a monument. Now we they included. Could you hold that up there? Could you hold that up? Okay. Oh, I see the little cross there. Yeah. Well, the, you saw some woods back here, yeah. uh, and that was why Nelson was killed. Oh, wow. We've been to Missouri to visit his family, not Dell and I, but... Okay. 
Yeah, here's uh, the monument with um, Nelson. Melvin? Mm -hmm. I, I used to give some talks to schools, but I don't anymore. The last talk I gave was to a bunch of seniors, juniors, same teacher. And he taught juniors and seniors, <coughs> English or whatever it was. And I'm a teacher. You know, I taught 37, 30, 35 years, whatever it was. Anyway, these seniors in that classroom, they were kind of blase and went there. And the, so I started making the stories of the gory. I didn't lie, I told them the truth. The more gory the, uh, I got made the stories, the more that they went to sleep. <laughs> that was Chippewa Valley. Of course, that was Chippewa Valley. <coughs> These pictures are going to be hard to copy. Ooh. This is, um, this is, uh, this must be another picture of uh, there may be two look at Nelson. Nelson. No, no. Nelson. Yeah, there are some pictures of him. It's okay. got a helmet with a hole in it. No, that's his system. Uh, who's is somebody holding it? No, it's got a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. That's, they took his helmet, somebody took his helmet, and they put a stake yeah. in the ground. And this happened, that was taken in Missouri. They lived in Missouri. They brought his body back and buried him in Missouri. And that family is very appreciative of my contacting them. Arlington. Uh, we went to <coughs> George Patton Jr., the second George Patton. His funeral burial service was in Washington. We did not go to his funeral in, in Nick, Massachusetts. Uh, what did he die of? Just old age? Yeah, more or less. He had Alzheimer's. He had uh, oh, Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And he had, I think he finally had dementia. None of his boys ever reached the same level that he did, eh? Not that I don't know, but one that was a neighbor was just a seaman. And the cottonwood and the writer. That's too bad. Uh, <laughs> they did not follow Patton's footsteps. The, the amount of time that or even he it. spent in the war was depriving his kids of his presence. Mm -hmm. And guidance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
for sure. But Pat, I, I think we've been the greatest pilot. Too, not too paternalistic. Huh? <laughs> no. Well, that would have been interesting. What kind of a Your father, father he really point. could have been. He, he thought yeah. wonderful Hard way. to say, That's taken it. out of his element. Uh -huh. When his kids learn to swear, he, <laughs> he give him a piece of candy. <laughs> <laughs> and teach him another word. Master of the, of the other language. So you ended up teaching for how long? 35 years. Sixth grade. Most, six? Practically all of it was sixth grade. Really? Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't stand junior high age. And the high school, they were too, a little too sophisticated for me. I have, uh, I work with uh, the fifth, fourth and fifth graders over yes. at Holden Elementary That's in wonderful. Sterling Heights. It's wonderful. What do you do with them? I work with them, it's kind of a, uh, Alternate education group. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. I get the troublemakers, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. she gets a chance to get them out of the classroom, and they work with math and English and reading and science. I bet you're good at that. That's great. Well, I don't know. I yeah, we always so. wonder. <clears throat> you think you're some of them are one on one because they need. They have to do others are trying to get them to work together. I'm trying to lay out a program where we can find out where they are when we start and measure how far we got so at the end of the semester we know what we did and what we weren't able to get to. See. But it's amazing, that school, 90% of those kids are multilingual. I mean multi. Doing three languages. And they really don't spend much time developing that. You know, we got to get them yeah. to They could teach other kids, too. Middle East. Mm -hmm. I thought I would probably one. If they don't do anything about it, mm -hmm. they'll lose it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a girl come to my room right from Italy. She had been here about three or four days. She came over to live with a relative. Well, her father came over first. And the mother stayed in Italy, and they flew her to uh, her aunts. And in that home, the grandmother spoke Polish, the father spoke Italian, and somebody spoke English, I don't know. <laughs> uh, three languages. Yeah, they know. Um, but she learned English fast. They really adapt. Uh, She's in the sixth grade. Well, the boys teased her. And she learned a lot of English fast. A lot of the kids are uh, in the old Czech Republic, mm -hmm. uh, Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. Albania, uh, Chinese, Mexican. Mm -hmm. I had a Chinese kid come, but he could speak English. I had a Lithuanian girl come right to my class, and she couldn't speak English. She learned very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you have any questions, Anne? No, I think you covered pretty much everything. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Oh, I'm good for a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can take in one sitting, though. God bless you. <laughs> Um, I have some hang-ups about the war. I have a pretty good, uh, lively case of PTSD in the war. And that isn't from the fighting, that's from what happened after the war. I'm very antagonistic about some things that took place after the war. I had no problems with, with during the war. I wish the war never stopped. Because the fact that I come home, it was worse than the war. But he still has flashbacks where he can see the oh, scenery. Really? Uh -huh. I can, 
to his, my eyes, I could see any battle that I was in. You can just recall it. I was yeah. 200 Rado. days, about 60 battles. Mm -hmm. and I, 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 I can, if something has a trigger, but it, I can see them all the love you, I can see them the so sure, I can see, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Buxom, uh, Bulge, uh, the uh, Central France, the right wing, any battle, I can see yeah. the battle. Sometimes the battle is in the boy, there it is. Every detail. Mm -hmm. mm. And you'll say, right now I'm seeing this occur. Yeah. While we were chatting, were you able to vision some of those? Yeah. Well, if I don't recall which I envisioned, but mm -hmm. I'm sure I did. Mm -hmm. So what is it you're upset about? I don't know. What do I get? Well, other people's attitudes and different things. Mm -hmm. uh, that bothers them all. But some, he's very sensitive about battle if something triggers it. Yeah. He goes to PTSD class every Thursday. What is that? Post oh, the VA. Oh. post traumatic Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I've been that way ever since I've been out of service. But the, I, the way I offset it, keep busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smart. I worked, I built my folks a house, I worked on a channel hours a day, and then go to the bar and have a fist fight. No. That but he doesn't think so. Get me out of mischief. That was when you were young. And then I went to college. I got along wonderful at college. I yeah. settled down. I had a problem. I had no trouble with anybody, uh, and I taught the whole years. And I have a doctorate of education, and I have a doctorate of divinity. There's too many guys that come in with two doctor degrees. No. How did you get to know a lot about his experiences? Just conversation. No. And I, well, when we were dating, I uh, proofread his book and checked it out. Which is his book? Yeah, it's, we'll it's give you a, a copy. <clears throat> and what is it about? Me. Not you? The war. And the war. <laughs> Wow. Now, there wasn't always the term PTSD. No, that's recent. Recent. And, and when that was kind of identified in you, did that, did that help you to know that there was a real diagnosis or it was a real thing? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I sort of fought my own battle. When they coined the actual term. Yeah, I, I didn't pay that much attention to it. Because I, I had to fight my own battle, yeah. emotionally speaking, by working hard. And I, I, have, I had very good success teaching. I could, I, could walk, I could walk into my classroom and shut the door behind me. Nothing. I was, I was as calm as could be. Because I had something to do. I had, to, uh, I had to do it to, mm -hmm. in the appropriate way. <coughs> did you take advantage of your your uh, GI? Did you take advantage of your GI benefits? I used them all. You used them all. I had four years of entitlement. And I used. Them. What What made you decide to go to school in Ohio? Defiance College. Yeah, what made you decide to go there when you the were living in... I could find, uh, see, I, I was held over for six months for, for right. occupation. Well, in the meantime, all the other GIs got home, got home before I did. Not all of them, but many of them. So many of them. They filled up the colleges. And wow. I, I wrote the colleges. A lot of 
returning vets that went to college and these colleges couldn't handle the load. So, they so, for from so for the Massachusetts, mm -hmm. the first place you could find that had an opening was in Defiance, Ohio? Yeah, Defiance. Wow. And University of Minnesota said they would accept me for the summer term, mm -hmm. but no, no promise that I could be accepted for the fall term. Okay. They were just full. Don't, don't feel bad. That's going on right now here in the state of Michigan. Seven, Graduating kids are mm -hmm. not being assured there will be something in the fall. Right. Uh, I like Defiance. It's small. Uh, although it was a good, it was a good college. I had a very good attitude at college. My attitude changed just like overnight from going to leaving the home. Head. See, I had to get out of my hometown. It was. <laughs> it was to, to well, who watched over your folks? My folks, they, they, they were, were self-sufficient. They, they were very self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, my father and mother, uh, they were right up until the nineties. They were. My mother was bossing me around <laughs> in ninety-two. <laughs> Here, I'm sixty-some. She's telling me now, you get your brother, and you and your brother go to the undertaker. And you pick out a car coffin for Dad and I, and no, don't spend too much money, and don't make it too fancy. Bury me and I want to be buried in my yellow dress. <laughs> You're lucky. I would love to have my mother here to boss me around. Yeah, she is not here now. No. No, she died in the eighties. Mm -hmm. She was eight, she was yeah. ninety two, mm -hmm. and still bossing me around. Mm -hmm. She she never got Alzheimer's. Nothing, you know, uh, my father didn't either. My father lived a year and a half after she died, and I go to see him. He, they, they were in, they were from Massachusetts. My brother and his family had them moved to Connecticut, where they could look in on. Them. And they had them uh, an apartment complex, senior citizen apartment complex, for <coughs> two years. Then they went in a nursing home. They passed away there. You didn't. You didn't uh, finish your conversation with me about Patton, <laughs> and I'm Sorry, anxious <laughs> to see if you had further hope that you could tell me. Any further contact with him? Oh, you about said, assassination? Yeah. How did you know what I was talking mm -hmm. about? Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> You you stopped talking after you said assassination, and I didn't bother to push it. Well, I am now. Uh, Who do you think was the assassinated? Off the record. I have no idea. I don't believe that. No. <laughs> I believe you do have a pretty good idea. Uh, there's two possibilities. One, the Russians were spying on him all the time because he wanted to attack Russia. Right. Mm -hmm. And that and wasn't any secret. No, no, no. He, he said it publicly. Right. The second was jealousy among the, uh, the hierarchy of okay. the European theater. And, and uh, I can't tell you who. The Russian, the Russian spies, there was a name given by somebody who the Russian spy might have been. Uh, but uh, as far as the American, I, do, I would know who. But uh, uh, they, they had it timed. He was going hunting. And they knew how and when. And I think it went, I don't know. I, I just believe he was assassinated. I mean, it, it, it's the movie treated it so abruptly, you know, a wagon ran into his car, they just... I talked to and Mrs. Then they stopped and moved on, and it just... Yeah, they... Uh, I talked to Mrs. Patton. Uh, no, she's not Mrs. Patton, but... Uh, Patton's daughter. Daughter. Daughter-in-law, yeah, sorry. Um, you know her when she took us out to the rest of me, and I, I pointed at one blank asked her. I said, I think Patton was assassinated. You agree? She fumbled around. She didn't say yes. She didn't say no. 
and I wasn't able to get any more information from her. Was she particularly close to the general? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, she wouldn't have seen him very much no. because he's moving all over the place. Uh, and now I say that he yeah. was transferred yeah. duty-wise. He moved around. Now who was the one he was dallying with? His it was niece. His niece. His niece. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she would have been quite a bit younger than him, wouldn't she? Well, yeah, but that's. Uh, how, how much younger? Oh, 20, 30 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Boy, he never did things in a small way. It was always something. <laughs> uh, I do not have any proof of that. No. But I have a good, good source. Base gossip. <laughs> when we're talking, we don't need proof at this point. Uh, I still, I still hold Patton very high. Yeah. He was a general. Well, was, with the kind of attitude and the way he was, he, he would generate people that would be jealous. That's very believable. Now they said he was anti-Jewish. He <laughs> several Jews on his staff. Now a guy that's anti-Jewish isn't going to have. Yeah, people on his staff. If you were it. useful to him, you were yeah, right. And it didn't make a difference what who and the same with the blacks. He if they were the black bank battalion was part of the fighting battalion, he loved them. I mean in civilian life you may not have liked blacks or Jews, but when it came down to fighting, yeah. if you were useful for his purpose. Right. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, he was very vocal about what he didn't like. So that solicited a lot of yeah. angry people mm -hmm. that could have been any part of any. Yes, he was. He was very vocal. Yes. Yes. Actually, it probably was the best thing that ever happened to him. I don't know what the hell he would have done if he had to go back to civilian yeah, life. Yeah, he, he would, would have been have unhappy. Along. Very unhappy. Yes. He would have wanted to get in the war somehow. Oh, he yeah. wanted to go to the Pacific, but that. Uh, uh, MacArthur wouldn't have it because you know the too many eagles, right. too much eagle, and uh, uh, he he would like to take an over somewhere. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> he was he was a, a quite a guy. Uh, I know he was he probably wasn't likable, but on the other hand, he was knowledgeable. Yeah. You ought to read this sometime. Okay, okay let me see. Brothers in Arms by that basketball player. I've read it from cover to cover. And I'll be down. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know he was in the Army. Well, I don't know uh, if he was. Well, it looks like this one guy sitting here looks like I don't seven think foot tall. He must have wrote this a long time. And that's, you know, oh, yes, uh, the, see, there was no, two. he wouldn't have been in there, what am I talking about? He you know, he couldn't have been in Civil War II. Uh, you see, uh, during World War II, with segregation and, and like it was, discrimination and so forth, there was very little said about the blacks. No, it just, it just, newspapers just didn't Their print. Accomplishments, yeah. What would he have known about World War II and the black? So well, I just think it's a compilation yeah. of his. You know, he uh, he had stuff. a group. He interviewed. Uh, it was there really a group that I think wrote that book? Oh, it I doesn't see. say that, but I'm, I'm sure it must be because of when as it reads, uh, he couldn't have been all those places himself. Oh, he wasn't that old. <laughs> oh, no, he... <clears throat> but he depend. Remember now, uh, in the Black Tank Battalion, there was a lot of college graduates driving tanks. Oh, this is related to the Black Tank group. Yeah. No, I didn't. Brother no. Zahn said Black. I didn't... Everybody that tells us... I didn't story. make that... They said they had engineers and others. Well, it was... It was a black 
paratroop, uh, paratroop uh, battalion in the 82nd Division. That's our friend. Yeah, I think uh, he's waiting to here. He's, he's, take he's all right. He's a, he's a good guy. Good. That's a book that's worth reading, it's, mm -hmm. especially for me, where I fought with them. Mm -hmm. But the interaction of uh, saving each other on different occasions, I thought was unique. Very interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Unique. Okay. Well, sir, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Very Did interesting. Did shock you? <laughs> oh, no. Contributions there. I don't know them. We've, um, we've had a few that the wives were very intimately involved and could contribute, and that was very helpful. I right. worked for the military for quite a few years, you know, the reserve unit at the base itself. What did you do? I was secretary to the commanders of the uh, reserve units. Air Force. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to have an interview with you. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know anything, though. <laughs> uh, uh, she, uh, she had a mind, if I see. Uh, my first wife would not talk about the war. 57 years, she would not talk about the war. She would ignore it. She'd walk in the other room if I started to talk. So for 57 years, I didn't have any, you know, into intimately of a conversation. Then the Japanese lady, her husband had been a full-time military man. He was in and retired, and he was uh, he met her in Okinawa, mm -hmm. and he was in Vietnam. He was in uh, was a while before Vietnam. Korea. 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 He, he was in the Korea. He served in Korea. He was in the Air Force ground crew. And he he would have tours of duty. And, he, and then between tours, he'd be in Okinawa. Well, he went to, uh, took a night course or something. Probably was when I speak Japanese. And uh, he met Fumi. And they were married 36 years. And then he died. And uh, then we got together. Yeah. I knew her mm -hmm. know, for 25 years. And uh, Juan came down. <laughs> that must have been pretty hard for you not to be able to discuss it at all with your first wife. It was religion. She was, she was in that group. I hope I'm not stepping in the toes. The Jehovah Witness. Uh -huh. But Jehovah Witness has us. Has, has, has another has another group, an offshoot an offshoot group called Dawn Dawn and uh, they uh, uh, for 57 years I went to church with her once in a while but I could not subscribe to that religion I I do go to church with Dawn and I love the church and it's called it's Church of Christ. It's a wonderful bunch of people, all black. Oh, really? Dell. Well, Dell and Black. Well, Dell and black. <laughs> Those, all the family got all black people. You, you didn't know she was black? No. <laughs> I wasn't really paying attention. But anyways, <laughs> and the fall of the Dovus is black too. But yeah, I, I have a good feeling toward black people. Obviously. Well, I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble if he doesn't. <laughs> Lots of trouble. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you.